Yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, it's really it's really a pleasure to talk about this stuff. Uh, I also should say that um, I noticed some experts in the audience, um, and I will almost certainly disappoint you um, because I'm just talking about very basics, like the very basics of equivariant deep learning. <clears throat> because I think that from a, the perspective of a mathematician, this is a really fascinating. Uh, a fascinating idea and I think it's got a lot of potential um, and we have seen some some instances of it being useful as a tool in mathematics but I think it's got a lot more uh, potential than has been demonstrated so far um, and so I'm hoping this will be an elementary look at a beautiful subject um, but I definitely won't be talking about anything that's um and are going to be particularly surprising to experts. And I think everything that I say today is um, in some sense known in the um, machine learning literature. Um, it's just, I kind of see my role as advertising these very nice ideas to mathematicians um, with the hope that mathematicians will see uh, the possibilities of applying this to a problem that uh, someone in machine learning may not be aware of. <clears throat> so here are two visions of a tiger through a rectangular telescope. And what I want to illustrate with these pictures is that our visual system has a limited symmetry. So in the top left um, picture, the tiger occurs in the bottom right. Whereas in the bottom right picture, the tiger occurs at the top left. And so what we're picking up there is some kind of invariance of our visual uh, perceptive apparatus. Um, but if I were to stand on my head and look at an image of a tiger, uh, I might struggle. You know, I probably would still be able to recognize a tiger, but definitely my ability to recognize objects goes down a little bit. And so um, there's not a complete invariance. Okay, so there's some kind of partial invariance to translations and rotations in our visual apparatus. Here's another example. Uh, here is a flock of, flock of birds forming a beautiful pattern. And if you look at this flock of birds, we're immediately able to ascribe some kind of global topological structure to this, to this swarm. But if you think about the way that we might give this data to a computer, we would give a sequence of vertices. Oh, sorry, we'd give a, a sequence of coordinates. <clears throat> and there's, we would like to be able to tell our model, for example, that the ordering of these points does not matter. Because we, when we're looking at this image, we don't, we don't kind of think that in the middle is bird number 568. Another example is if we're trying to solve, let's say a heat equation or something like this on the surface of a sphere, we expect anything that we do to be equivariant with respect to the rotation action on a sphere with respect to SO3. And so this is another example where we're trying to perform an equivariant learning task. <clears throat> so what I'm talking about today is geometric deep learning which is basically how does one build equivariant neural nets? Um, here are some references. Uh, this is a, um, a book which can, so somehow my pointer is not working. Okay, it's still not working. Um, so Geometric Deep Learning is a, is a draft of a book. I think it's not yet published. Um, where this, this stuff is covered in quite a lot of detail. Um, and if you're a mathematician, this paper <coughs> by Yarotsky is very interesting. It's very much a kind of pure mathematician's take on, um, on deep neural nets. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not kind of fully aware of the literature. Um, I found these particular works um, very interesting, uh, but you know, this is not meant to be a bibliography of the subject. 
Okay. And one of the things that I find so compelling about geometric deep learning is that it provides a very good example of how far you can get via very simple principles of preservation of symmetry. So I think when you first, for example, see the structure of a convolutional neural net, it might look like a kind of engineering feat. Uh, but I claim that if you look at CNN from the perspective of some equivariance, in fact, there's kind of three principles. So um, equivariance, invariance, and locality, which basically tell you how a CNN has to look, which is very powerful because you spend a lot of time trying to design CNN architecture, but then you might want to apply it in a different, different setting. And if you've understood the basic principles by which you you operate, then it might be easier to to um, to do something in a different setting. So, also, I'm, my my background as a mathematician is in representation theory, and representation theory is very much the study of linear symmetry. Um, so, there's two ex incredibly inspiring papers. So, this is a paper of Gross, the the role of symmetry in fundamental physics, and one of the most inspiring papers that I know is Langland's paper on representation theory, its rise and its role in number theory. And both of these papers point out how simple considerations of symmetry lead to very, very deep um, tools and conjectures and results about the mathematical world. And I think that this also has a place in deep learning. I also should say that uh, I love questions. So, um, I regard this as an informal talk. So if you have a question, just let me know. Unmute yourself and let me know. So just want to recall very briefly what the kind of classical take on convolutional neural nets is, and then explain how to understand it from a group theoretic point of view. So here we have a filter, which is this, um, um, this has never happened to me before that I've lost my pointer. So if anyone knows how to fix that, let me know. Um, so we have a filter in the middle and we, we take our pixel values. So our image on the left is a matrix of pixel values. We take our um, filter, we dot product it with the um, pixel values on the left, and then we sum up the values and that gives us our pixel value on the right. And this particular filter you'll see that if, it, if you would apply it to an area where all the pixel values are the same, it will give you a very low value. Whereas if you apply it to an area because like eight is almost minus one plus minus one plus minus one plus minus one, eight is almost the sums of the things around the outside. So to uniform, uniform blocks of color are sent to black, whereas uh, drastic changes in color are sent to white. And so this is a kind of outline filter. And then, of course, the idea in machine learning is not to kind of prescribe these filters a priori, but to, uh, to learn them. But I just want to point out the kind of group theoretic fact, which is that if we regard this um, image in the top left <coughs> as being concentrated on the lattice Z squared, then this filter, so Z squared is a group, and applying this filter is the same thing as convolving with this element of the group algebra. So this is saying like, you know, at my point, I move up and right. I minus one, I take minus one times that. I move right, I take minus one times that, et cetera. I add them up and then I add eight times the, the point where I am. So this mathematical notion of convolution exactly corresponds to the conception of applying a filter to an image. And, and this is what a uh, CNN looks like. So what I'm going to assume is we have a fixed width, which is equal to our height. And we are considering a periodic image. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the image on the right and I'm kind of compactifying it. If I'm a physicist, um, and this is just simplifies the treatment below a little bit. So I'm a, if you want, I'm trying to classify images on the torus. And so what I want to do is learn a function which 
uh, given as input a picture, which I can see as a function on Z mod H Z squared, outputs a number, which is, for example, positive on tigers and negative on non-tigers. Okay. <coughs> How do I do that? So this is the kind of classical architecture of CNN. Uh, we, maybe I can just start using um, this or something. No. Okay. So we start off with our picture. And then in the classical language, we would say that we apply a filter that we've learned. So a filter restricted to some local area, apply a whole bunch of filters, then apply filters to that. Maybe have some pooling, maybe apply some more filters, maybe have some more pooling, and then maybe have a fully connected layer at the end. And then at the end, we would um, get down to our real value. So this is a kind of schematic of a CNN. And below, I'm basically going to ignore this, um, this pooling business. <laughs> okay. So that I just want you to have that rough schematic in mind. So if we just recast this in the language of group theory, um, Z mod H Z squared is a group. And what I'm doing is um, each layer is given by a convolution. Um, so here, are, so gamma, so that, that's important. So gamma is Z mod H Z squared. So that's my group. And we're viewing our image as a function on this group. And our layers correspond to convolution with a filter, which is a function on our group. Now, a very important aspect of convolution is that it's gamma equivariant. So a basic statement in, um, in uh, representation theory is that the gamma linear, so the equivariant functions between functions on gamma and functions on gamma are exactly functions on gamma. So why is this a little bit surprising? So if we dropped um, gamma equivariant here, we'd be looking at R linear homomorphisms from um, functions on gamma to functions on gamma. So this would be like um, matrices of size gamma squared. But in fact, when we impose the equivariants, we just get um, a vector space of dimension <coughs> the size of gamma. So we loop by imposing these equivariants, these layers are cut down by a factor of um, the order of gamma. Okay. So now I want to illustrate these simple principles in this example. So we want a gamma equivariant answer. So this is what I was trying to explain before with the tiger. <clears throat> so convolution and ReLU. So, um, you know, I hope for most of the audience, ReLU is not a surprise. So this is the function which takes a, um, takes a function here and replaces its negative values by zero. So it takes a vector and zeros out all the negative values. And this is a gamma equivariant map. So basically we're building our network out of gamma equivariant pieces. So we have this gamma equivariant and linear convolution together with an, our non-linearity is also gamma equivariant and we're ignoring pooling layers. And locality, so often in CNNs, it's typical to assume that the first few layers are local in that the value at a particular pixel only depends on some kind of neighboring pixels, you know, which is apparently what also happens in our visual apparatus early, early in the visual cortex. And Locality says that these convolutions, which before we said should be any function on, um, on gamma, are actually supported near the identity. So here, one should think about if, if you allow anything, you have something like the size of gamma. So that's the number of parameters in each one of these, um, in each one of these 
layers up here, but in locality changes gamma to something like nine. Okay, so it's a rather dramatic, dramatic drop in parameters. And <clears throat> yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize that point again in a second, but I just want to point out um, the fact that these three assumptions basically force you to design a CNN. So invariance of the answer, equivariance of the um, network structure and locality, essentially, once you have those principles in mind, you will just write down the architecture of a convolutional neural net, which is, you know, my, and with, under my understanding, this is one of the most successful <coughs> neural net architectures, follows from simple principles. And another extremely important basic point, um, which I think was really rammed home to me by conversa conversations with um, Sebastian, who is kindly here, but I apologize that um, there won't be so much interesting things for him, is that uh, imagine a fully connected neural net. So here's my, let's say my input, here's my next layer. So I have L1 times L2, L2 parameters. So this number can quickly get out of hand. <clears throat> um, whereas if we look at a first layer of a one-dimensional CNN that's local, so this means that um, this pixel value only depends on these three values. And additionally, the way that it depends, these X, Y, Zs are invariant under translation. So now independent of size, there's three parameters. So you can imagine that with these simple considerations, I can suddenly build much larger neural nets with much many fewer parameters. So I might in a second just ask someone to ask a question. Um, so be prepared. Because somehow I, dis I dislike talking into the ether and not knowing if anyone's understanding anything. Or maybe this is very, very straightforward to everyone. Um, so general case, we have a group. So it might be a finite group, a Lie group, and we have a transitive gamma set. And we want to learn an invariant or equivariant function. So one of the things that we would teach people in a first course in representation theory is that the only linear functions the only equivariant linear functions between a transitive um, gamma set and the trivial representation is essentially the function that sums all the values. So this is a fancy way of saying, you know, if X is a finite set, this is just sum all, sum all over all the values. Okay, so we're always learning a nonlinear function, basically, unless it's a very boring kind of center of mass type measurement or something like that. And so here's the blueprint. We fix a group. Um, we have a transitive gamma set that we want to learn on. And then we choose a whole lot of transitive gamma sets, X, I, J. And then th here's our architecture. Whoops. Um, <clears throat> so this is our, this is our architecture, which I claim specializes to, for example, a convolutional neural net. So we have functions on our um, transitive sets, and then we have equivariant maps between them. And two points is that if gamma has some kind of metric, for example, in the example of Z squared, you have the natural metric. And now you can ask that convolutions be supported near the identity. This gives you some notion of um, locality. And the other very important basic thing is that it's very important to know what the space of equivariant maps is from one transitive G set to another. And this is given by this beautiful double coset formula. Okay, this is another kind of fundamental basic statement in representation theory. Okay, so could I please request that someone ask a question?
Yeah, I have a question. So here, sure. yeah, you are considering a value function. So if mm -hmm. I consider, for example, sigmoid, then um, mm -hmm. can it can we make it equivariant? Yeah. So anything, as long as I have a um, functions on a set, any pointwise activation function will be equivariant. Okay. So I can take ReLU. I can also take sigmoid. I can take any point as long as I do a pointwise ac activation. There's no problem. Pointwise activation. Yeah, so this means that I take my vector and I do the same thing to every, I apply the same function to every coordinate. Mm, I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, so now what I want to do is just explain <clears throat> what this blueprint gives in two examples, uh, and then I'll finish with some um, kind of speculative questions. Okay. So I should say that I've kind of already done example zero, which is the example of a CNN. So a CNN is essentially this, this structure, as long as we ignore like tri tricky things like pooling layers, but also in, in that geometric deep learning book, it's explained that you can you can also incorporate pooling layers by looking at kind of sums over cosets and things like this. This, this also has a um, interpretation. Okay. So I'm ignoring I'm ignoring stuff like pooling, but um, that's just to simplify the exposition. So here's an example of the blueprint. So this is the example that I discussed before. So this is an example that people actually care about. Um, you know, ha and have cared about in machine learning. So it's not a new example. Um, and this is the question of learning on the sphere. So here we have the um, rotations of the sphere. So these are the three times three orthogonal matrices of determinant one. So I fix an axis and I rotate through it. It's a beautiful Lie group. And this acts on the two sphere. And we want to make an, for example, SO3 invariant prediction. So an example might be, for example, recognizing images. You know, let's say we have some kind of like data from telescopes pointing out to the universe. Then this would be an example where we would like to like recognize a, a function, which is a, an image, which naturally lives on the sphere. <clears throat> so now what are the homogeneous um, spaces for, um, for SO3? So that means the transitive sets on which SO3 acts, there's SO3 mod a finite subgroup, which I'm basically going to ignore, including SO3 itself. There's S2 and there's RP1. <clears throat> and um, here I don't have many choices. So what I'm just going to take is functions on S2 the whole time. And, and perhaps I could, I could put, um, you know, here I can replace this with functions on a point. If I'm actually making, if, if, my, if the prediction that I want to make is actually invariant. Functions on a point. So now we use our double coset formula to decide what are the SO3 equivariant convolutions. So this tell, tell us kind of what are the, um, what are the convolutions what are the analog? So in CNNs, we have this analog of a um, local convolution with a little filter. What are the analogs of filters in the um, general equivariant world? So this is the key formula. So it says, <laughs> so any transitive set is of this form, SO3 mod some subgroup. And then the convolutions between such function spaces are given by functions on the double coset. And often one needs to kind of be a little bit careful interpreting this formula, like there might be some finiteness conditions or something like that. But the formula is an incredibly useful general guiding principle. So uh, here's an example. So SO3 mod S1 is S2. So SO3 acts on S2 and the stabilizer is S1. And SO3 mod S1 is a point. <clears throat> and so before I told you that the only equivariant um, maps between functions on the two sphere and R 
are the um, kind of integrate over S2. And this pops out of our formula because SO3 mod SO3, this is already a point. Now, a better example is if I look at what are the convolutions between um, functions on S2 and functions on S2. So this would actually be a convolution here. So here the answer is really beautiful. So this is um, SO3 mod S1. So this is S2. And now I take S2 and I mod out by the rotation action. And what I get is basically functions on the unit interval. So any such function is determined by its restriction to an arc from the South Pole to the North Pole. And what is the convolution? Convolution is very beautiful. Uh, so imagine that I have such a function over here. So this is an element inside here. And I could take a function, which is, for example, a, a direct delta function um, at length gamma along my interval. And what this convolution does is it takes a function, so this eats a function, and should produce another function. So it should eat a function, and I should be able to evaluate this thing at a point. And the evaluation at a point is the integral of the original thing around an arc at distance gamma from... Um, so we integrate around this arc at distance gamma from x. So it's a beautiful thought experiment, experiment to convince yourself that this is indeed an intertwiner between. Um, this is something that takes a function on SO2 and outputs another function on SO2 in an equivariant way. And so these are the typical things that we would like to train. These are the analogs of our convolutions. And notice the massive reduction in parameters here. So to actually implement all of this on a computer would be extremely difficult and would probably involve complexities that I'm not aware of. But I hope you agree that there's a big difference between the size of all functions on the two sphere and the size of all functions on, um, on an interval. Okay. So you can see the kind of power that equivariance has in reducing um, the number of parameters. Mm -hmm. And there's a lovely kind of parallel here. Um, in the abelian case, you get that equivariance and locality drastically reduces parameters. And um, I kind of suspect that once we start using um, more complicated groups in, in machine learning, <clears throat> um, locality will play less of a role, but the complexity of the group will start playing a role. So the fact that SO2 mod S1 mod S1 is this space, and this is a rather simple space, is to do with the fact that, sorry, SO3, um, is to do with the non abelianness of SO3. And so um, I guess a slogan should be that non abelian learning will end up involving far fewer parameters. Okay, so I just want to kind of do one little bit of kind of maths here, um, which is why this emphasis on permutation representations. So there's a very nice little lemma. So a permutation representation is just functions on a G set. And if we have a finite, um, finite group, this is saying that we have a representation in which each gamma is represented by permutation matrices. And this kind of answers the question of why, um, why permutation representations are so important. Basically, they're the only representations that support an equivariant ReLU. OK, so permutation. So the lemma says, at least for finite gamma, that permutation representation, if and only if supports equivariant ReLU. With respect to some basis. So there exists a basis such that my representation is equivariant, 
sorry, that such that ReLU is equivariant if and only if I'm a permutation representation. And one of the things that I'm very excited about is the possibility of um, neural nets involving um, gamma equivariant piecewise linear li nonlinearities, which are no longer um, permutations. And so this, this necessitates um, changing the, your point of view on what nonlinear um, nonlinearities you allow. So I'm very happy to talk about that if, if people are interested. So here's another example of this blueprint in action. Uh, so here we have a, a point cloud and we're trying to make a prediction from a point cloud. So we have a whole lot of points, but their order does not matter. So what we're trying to do is learn a function which takes in an n tuple, a big n tuple of a certain number of points. So for example, in this example, we'd have, you know, R3 to the 10,000 or something. And we'd like to output some, some assessment. And we reorder our indices here so that we have naturally something on which the symmetric group acts. So, Sn acts on R to the N by permuting coordinates. And what we want is a prediction that is Sn invariant. So how does our blueprint work in this particular case? So th there's two obvious permutation representations. There's functions on an N set and there's functions on a one point set. So with its trivial, so Sn acts on a one point set trivially. And now we can again use our double coset formula to work out um, what our intertwiners can be. So for example, the intertwiner from the um, n-dimensional representation to the one-dimensional representation is again one-dimensional given by summing over all the elements. That's what I'm writing here. The map from the trivial representation to the n-dimensional representation is given by the map that sends one to the sum over all the basis elements. And the claim is, so this is the kind of only non-trivial claim here, is that the SN equivariant homomorphisms from an N set to itself is exactly two-dimensional. So if you were thinking about this as being a layer in a fully connected neural net, this would be N squared dimensional. So the dimension would grow quadratically in N, but when we impose this equivariance, there's only, the, this space of intertwiners is two-dimensional independent of N which seems very useful. And if you write down our blueprint, you get exactly this deep set architecture that's um, very popular and advocated by Zahir et al in 2017. So for example, here's our three, three point coordinate in our um, birds example. We, we take a, some number of copies of n in the trivial representation, some number of copies of n in the trivial representation down to here. And now notice that, you know, from here to here, we only have a two dimensional space of parameters rather than an n squared space of parameters. So there's a massive reduction in, in parameters. And the other remarkable thing, which um, I think is not pointed out enough in this setting, is that if I've trained this neural net for, um, let's say, 10,000 birds, it makes sense to evaluate it on 11,000 birds. Okay. Because everything in this architecture is independent of n. And somehow I've done some experiments to try to make this work in examples, and I haven't really gotten it to work yet, but um, it seems very interesting to me from the perspective of kind of the difficulty of generalization in machine learning, that here we have an architecture that um, appears to kind of generalize out of the box. <clears throat> okay, but as I said, there's some, there's always some devil in the details in getting these things to train and, um, and finding the right problem and things like that. And I haven't actually managed to find a good problem where this um, generalizes well. Okay, so, um, 
Problem one is to find an interesting learning problem whose symmetries are, are an interesting non-abelian group. I think this is a really fascinating problem um, and I'd love to hear from people if they have ideas. Um, it just seems like a kind of, it, this is why I call this the, ha the hammer waiting for a nail. Um, and th so there was one application of very related ideas which is these notion of graph neural nets, where this was very useful in work I did with um, Charles Blundell, Lars Buzing, Alex Davies, Petar Velichkovich um, from DeepMind. Um, so there we used um, graph neural nets to attack um, a problem in pure mathematics around cash and Lipschitz polynomials. Okay. Um, so the, the philosophy of graph neural nets is very similar in that you use graph structure to restrict what possible layers you can have in a neural net, but I don't yet know of some really compelling examples of geometric deep learning in pure mathematics. The other question that um, I think is very interesting. Um, so, you know, a fundamental theorem in, um, in machine learning is universality. So that neural nets can approximate any function on a bounded region arbitrarily well. Um, and also there's, you know, fascinating questions of how well they can do that, how many parameters you need, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and th there's a really beautiful discussion in this, in this paper, but um, I'm still struggling with the, tr to, to understand from a conceptual point of view, what happens when I restrict my building blocks. So for example, in deep sets back up here, I've kind of made this arbitrary choice to only allow myself two sets. So I'm allowed, um, you know, in deep sets, I'm allowed the, the set with one element and I'm allowed the set one, two, up to N. And of course the symmetric group does act naturally on these, but what about the set, for example, of distinct elements? You know, this is another very interesting um, SN set. And this set shows up a lot in, um, in for example, problems in um, in graph theory. Um, and I'm not aware of a result which says something like, uh, you know, if I fix my building blocks, I can only get a certain class of equivariant functions. Okay. So this, this paper, if I understand it correctly, basically says that um, if I'm allowed kind of any represent, any permutation representations, then I, then I have some kind of universality. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so um, I've been thinking about this with Joel Gibson and Sebastien Racanier, and um, I think there's very interesting stuff here, but it's still at a very early stage, so hopefully I can talk about that when it's riper. So um, I finished a bit early, but thank you very much. <laughs>